Last time on Love at First Shot. Tell me, as a mom, what are you looking forward to? Because you guys are shooting together. I knew it was probably going to be a hostile environment, but I didn't care. I really thought it needed to be talked about. The whole idea of every mother or father carrying a baby and also packing heat is very disturbing to me. Of course, one of the critical components of concealed carry is how easy it is for you to conceal your firearm. Today's episode of 27 Words is about my favorite topic, guns. To keep and bear arms seems pretty straightforward, and you'll notice it doesn't include any qualifiers. Our season finale of Love at First Shot is all about celebrating freedom. You'll meet a high-powered corporate executive who's a financial advisor by day and a helicopter hog-hunting business owner by night. Julie Golub tells us what to expect and how to prepare for flying with firearms. We also present the last installment of our Concealed Carry Roundtable and wrap up the season with some final thoughts. Thanks so much for tuning into season four and a special thank you to our presenting sponsor, Smith & Wesson, for supporting our efforts to educate and celebrate women in firearms. This is Love at First Shot, presented by Smith & Wesson with ammunition provided by Federal Premium. point in time you may be interested in flying with firearms and there's some simple procedures to go through but first and foremost you need to do a bit of research to make sure you can actually bring that firearm with you to wherever your destination is and in between. The number one thing is that your firearm must be locked up in a hard side case. It must be unloaded. That is your responsibility. After that, different airlines have different rules, different airports have different rules, so it's really important that you're flexible throughout this entire process. Follow the direction of the gate agent or any agent that you're working with, but also know and understand that it's your responsibility to make sure that firearm is unloaded and locked in a hard side case. This is the case that I actually travel with. It's a simple hard sided aluminum case and it also has a combination lock. I like to travel with combinations because keys are very small and they can get lost. And the last thing you want to do when you're standing in line is dig around for a bunch of keys. You can also bring the case that your firearm came in, but keep in mind that some airports require that you have a lock for every single hole that's in that case. And in a case like this, it only has one, they may not allow you to fly with it because you can actually access through the side. So that's something to keep in mind. When you head up to check in, you'll need to declare your firearms. The language I like to use is, hello, <laughs> I have unloaded firearms to declare. This is very simple, concise, and clear. You don't need to say I have guns or anything crazy like that. The more clear, calm, collected, and friendly you are, the more likely this process is going to be simple and easy for you. And this is where they'll give you a slip of paper that has your name and other information on it so that the airline knows that you're declaring that firearm. You need to get this paperwork done. Don't let them tell you that you don't need it, this is absolutely paramount. Now where this piece of paperwork goes inside your case, that's all depending on the airline itself, but it's important that you go through the process. So once you've checked in your firearms with the gate agent, they may require you to head over to the Transportation Security Administration. They may say to sit back and relax while your bags go through. It all depends on the airport. Just follow the directions and wait to make sure that you and your guns are all set and ready to go. Here's another important tip. Never ever use your range bag or a bag that you've been using with your firearm or ammunition or anything of that sort as your carry-on. Because if you have a piece of brass, a firearms part, anything like that, you're gonna get hung up with the Transportation Security Administration security system that goes through and that's not a good thing. So even if it's a little bit of extra money to check that bag, I always keep my range bag in a large hard-sided case like this, along with my firearm in a hard-sided case as well to make this process as simple and easy and reduce the likelihood that I'll bring anything that I don't want to bring with me through the security point.
One thing you'll want to make sure that you plan to do when you go on your trip is add a little bit of extra time. They always say plan two hours ahead of time, add an hour to that if you're flying with firearms because you never know, you may need to go through a special services line and that can add time to your trip. You don't want to miss your flight. At the end of the day, it's really actually very simple. Be calm, cool, organized, be prepared before you get to the airport, and you'll find that this process is actually pretty simple. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to flight 247 to Denver. We hope you enjoy the flight. The more consistently you perform a task, the more comfortable and confident you are doing it. And that is why consistency is another C of concealed carry. And when you think about it, we have so many options now, especially as women within our wardrobe to carry concealed. We have minimalist, we have pocket carry, we have at waist carry in a belt like this. We also have athletic options so that we can carry when we're running. There are so many things to choose from. The problem is, you don't have a whole lot of consistency. And that may make it difficult for you to access your firearm when you need it most. You don't wanna be fumbling around wondering where your gun is when you need it. No matter what option you decide, you really need to train with this setup so that you can become familiar with it. You may have to reassess your wardrobe and you may have to reassess how you carry so that you develop a consistency so that you can have your firearm ready when you need it the most. Our forefathers left nothing to interpretation in their conclusion of the Second Amendment. Shall not be infringed could not be a more clear command. The law upon law and politician after politician do their damnedest to infringe on our right to bear arms in any way possible. And they say it's for our own safety, but is it? I'm Lydia Longoria. In today's episode of 27 Words, I'm going to draw the line on anti-gunners infringement on our right to bear arms. Firearm bans, magazine capacities, gun registries, waiting periods, one gun a month, and bullet buttons. Seemingly nothing has been off limits. Politicians claim it's for our own safety or to reduce crime. And maybe they're right. Is compromising such a bad thing? Truth is, pro-gunners have been compromising since the beginning of time. We went from arms to only owning semi-auto handguns, background checks in a NIC system that the government broke. And now we have to ask the government for a card that allows us to carry? I think the founders would be rolling in their graves. What we've done is grease the skids on a slippery slope towards more gun restrictions and less freedom. Elimination of guns in America is their end game. Hypocrites like Amy Schumer like to make fun of us when they say they're not coming for our guns, but then surround themselves with armed bodyguards or secret service protection. They either have no concepts of the threats faced by everyday American citizens, or they just don't care. But in all reality, they are most definitely coming for our guns. It's every liberal's fantasy to make America a gun-free zone. Because if they were really concerned with deterring violence, they would be more concerned about things that have actually proven to reduce crime, like prosecuting felony gun criminals and fixing the NICS system, than imposing more restrictions on law-abiding Americans. So next time an anti-gunner makes the ridiculous claim that gun owners should be more reasonable, tell them you will not compromise just to please a group who does not want you to have a firearm in the first place. I'm here with the lovely Lila Ontiveros, and I am so excited to talk to you, Lila, because you have got some really cool stuff going oh, thank on. Thank you very much. First of all, she created her own helicopter hog hunting business. So talk a little bit about your arc, like where you started, and then I definitely want to dig into what you're doing now. So my father's retired military. My mom teaches middle school. 
and my rebellious streak was to go to boarding school in the Northeast, and I worked on the trading floor for almost 10 years uh, in foreign exchange. Um, there aren't a lot of women on the trading floor on Wall Street, right? Yep, I, we sweat a lot. Uh, it was a 24-hour <laughs> business, didn't you know, get a whole lot of sleep. Came back to my hometown and work in, in a boutique investment firm. Wow. With some amazing people and doing really interesting things. And in addition to your yes, financial. What, what the kids call side hustle. I'm so excited to have my friend Lila here. She's gonna teach me everything I need to know. Do you have any advice for my first hunt? Well, the most important part, besides safety, obviously, is to just have a really epic time. Well, I think that's gonna happen because my first hog hunt is going to be out of a helicopter, and I don't think it can get much better than that. There's a lot of damage, man. There's gotta be something here. There always is, and I see fresh damage all over the place. This will be a good spot if we can get on a few here. See all the damage there? That's all fixed. So tell me, how did you get into this? I reconnected with a shorty sister of mine who grew up in a oh, wow. small town called Refugio, Texas. Uh, and her family's a massive uh, farming and ranching family in South Texas. And they've actually been helicopter hog hunting for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. And not so much as a hobby, but as a means to survive. <laughs> Piggy, piggy, piggy. Better than a duck call. I'm telling you, it's taken me many years to do that. Feral hogs are a massive problem for the American farmer. They lose thousands of dollars every single night due to hog damage. Oh my gosh. So they double in population every six months or so. So there's no way that we can kill enough to keep the hog population stagnant. We initially started out trapping them. We started a hog trapping business. You get 13 in a clip, we can take a, a helicopter up and get 100 in a few hours. Right. So it's just a, a lot more effective and it's a lot more fun, yeah. <laughs> to be quite honest. We used AR-15s when we were shooting. Um, do people use other platforms and what are those platforms like? I have heard plenty of people who use shotguns and this kind of blows my mind. You're hanging out in a, hel a moving helicopter yeah. while uh, the hog is moving. So. In a shotgun, you have two, sometimes three shells. You're not going to be able to be successful at any efficient rate. And it's not ethical either. You want to make sure that that pig is down. Correct. And if you're using a shotgun, you're not going to be able to use enough rounds to make sure that it's down. Absolutely. Oh, right, right, ahead, go. right ahead. All right. Okay. So he's going to put you in a good spot. All right, we got pig guys. Tell me when to go, Lila. Oh, All yeah. right, we're gonna put you in this field. Get in that open field. Well, this is gonna put you in the right spot. All right, girl, are you ready? Let's do this. All right, here we go. Right. Fire. There you go. Keep going. There you go. Keep going. Stay with the pack. Add a girl. There, one shot on that one. Keep going. Got him. Boom. Amazing. Crushed it. We just got five pigs. Woo! Freedom, baby. Let's go. Damn, girl, you're a good shot. Hey, yeah, she's not Holy messing around. Oh. This is just a small portion of what we're able to do with that Second Amendment. You know, we have the right to defend ourselves, our families, our homes, our properties. You know, and part of this, this is defending people's income. This is defending people's... Their livelihood. Their livelihood, their families. How are they going to feed their families? And so, you know, this in itself, this is self-protection, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. Absolutely, agreed. It's kind of a, almost a once in a lifetime. I mean, for you, it's a daily thing, I know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it really is an exciting, unusual trip that people can. We're so, feel inordinately blessed to be able to give people that once in a lifetime opportunity. You see the bonding that happens, it's really neat. So this was my first hunt, my first kill, and my first time in a helicopter. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I cannot wait to do it again. You're so right. It is such an adrenaline rush, and it's addicting. So freedom, <laughs> baby. This freedom. is the epitome of freedom.
We can talk concealed carry, home and personal protection, and competition all day long, but there's something to be said for good old fashioned planking. And so many of us have gotten our start in the wonderful world of shooting in this way. For this Smith & Wesson product spotlight here at Wilshire Gun Club, I have the Smith & Wesson Victory. First and foremost, it's chambered in 22 caliber, meaning it's soft and light in recoil, making it ideal for new and young shooters or anybody who's looking to improve their shooting skills. It is very easy to take down and maintain, and it comes right out of the box with adjustable fiber optic sights. But the great thing about the Victory is it's very easy to accessorize, as you can see what I've done right here. This gun features an aftermarket Volkortsen carbon fiber barrel and a Trijagon RMR red dot optic. And I've set this gun to be as light and easy to shoot as possible for my daughter for her first competition. Quiet, easy to maintain and customize, the Smith & Wesson Victory will provide hours of fun. So probably the most influential woman in the shooting sports today has to be Kim Rohde, because she is like a living legend. She's won more Olympic medals in six consecutive Olympic games. She's not slowing down one bit, and uh, she does so many things beyond just shooting. And she's such a great representative for getting kids out there and enjoying the outdoors, as well as you know, of course, fighting the fight for the NRA. And it really kind of opens the door for us as gun owners to have somebody so iconic, an Olympian of that caliber, pun intended, <laughs> um, out there and doing so many amazing things as well, uh, just beyond shooting and connecting with people and really kind of demystifying what, what many people think of gun owners. So if I were gonna name more influential women, I gotta start at the beginning. Like the woman that everybody knows, Annie Oakley, right? I mean, Little Miss Short Shot. And, and between all of the, the the movies and the references and everything else, you, you hear about this incredible lady shooter who was able to, you know, go on this traveling road show, Buffalo Bill's traveling road show, and do all these great things, make these amazing shots. But what a lot of people don't know is Annie was a really a, a feminist. I mean, she really believed that women should be able to protect themselves and they should know how to shoot. And she grew up, it was not a cool thing. I don't know of anybody who's quite like Annie. Like, nobody has ever been the complete package of incredible shooter, like, amazing trick shots. Um, and also, so much a, a female leader at the same time. I, I think that's like the magic moment, like the Michael Jordan, but like so many things, the perfect storm coming together, that's who Annie was. Nobody really may know her name, but Margaret Murdoch was such a, I didn't know who she was until I was at the Army Marksmanship Unit looking at her picture on the wall in their Hall of Fame. I'm like, wow, why is this woman here? Like there's no other women here, what's, what's the deal? Margaret Murdoch was the first woman to make a U.S. Olympic shooting team. Like, she made the team with the men. And uh, not only did she make the team with men, she actually won a silver medal in 1976. So she was proving that she was good enough to do with this with all of the guys and to medal at the Olympics. And uh, uh, she's uh, in Kansas, so not that far from me. Maybe one day, maybe one day I can sit down and talk to her. You've never met her. Never met Margaret. So the final woman that I would probably name today is someone that I've shot with a number of times, someone I looked up to as a little girl and is still in it winning um, in my type of shooting, and that's Kay Michalik. A lot of people may know her as Kay Clark, uh, born in an iconic gunsmithing family and uh, shooter family. Um, but Kay set the standard for women in action shooting for decades and uh, she's still out there shooting today. Her husband, Jerry Michalik, I mean, many people have heard of him as one of the fastest revolver shooters and most successful shooters of all time. She has a daughter who's a great shooter as well. But she's like this woman who's able to, to get women to step outside their comfort zone and say, you know what? If Kay can do it, I can do it. And uh, she's just absolutely fabulous. So between Annie Oakley, Margaret Murdoch, Kim Rohde, and Kay Michalik, these are the women that I feel are legends in the world of shooting and, and, and women in general.
Do you think there's a movement with social media for women who may have the secret woman gun owner lifestyle? Do you feel like they're more open? I think n no. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Because there was such a silent Trump vote. Mm. Yeah. And right. I think there's a large correlation. I personally changed my pub my Instagram to be public like I don't know, six months ago. Mm -hmm. Like, bring on the haters. Mm -hmm. They're not my real friends anyway. Feel free to defriend me, because I don't care. Just the political landscape that we have right now, everyone is so divided. And so it's either you're a good guy or a bad guy, and there's no in between, it's and nobody wants stripes. to listen mm -hmm. to the other side. Nobody wants to have a conversation. I think it's just so easy to attack people these days mm -hmm. yeah. that you know well, these types of things mm -hmm. are just infinitely more important to support other people. I was just telling her earlier, a very dear friend of mine, she calls me, you are never going to believe what happened to me today. She had posted a picture on her Instagram account of her grandfather's grave, which is at a national cemetery, and it said, this is why I would all caps never take a knee. Six weeks later, or over a month later, her boss in HR pulls her into an office and says, you are free to post whatever you would like on social media. However, if you would like to take, continue this brand of leadership, you will no longer escalate in our company. Whoa. She's uh, a lot smarter than I am and thinks before she speaks. And I don't do that. And she says, well, I said to myself, self, I think this is God telling you that you're, it's time to find a new job. It's, it's crazy that women feel like they have to hide that. And just the fact that people feel like it's some, you know, something they need to apologize for is all, almost makes me, I mean, mm. that makes me sad. I do feel like there was a specific point in time where being a firearms owner and going to the shooting range, it became a little bit, it, you didn't more have to hide it. Yeah. It was a little yeah. bit more popular and it was yeah, very sure. exciting and it was, and people were posting on social media and, mm -hmm. and it was, and, and people were being cheered on for going out and learning about it. It's okay to say, hey, I'm, this is who I am and I says, I'm proud to be a firearms owner as opposed to saying, I own guns. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. So what I love about all of the things that we've been talking about, they all have a core foundation of freedom. Obviously, in the competition world, we have a lot of people to look up to, but I'm wondering who are the women leaders in your life that have sparked that, that interest and that passion for freedom and what you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think my Nana, there's two things I love to talk about in this world, TCU football and my Nana. <laughs> things I can go on for years about. My Nana's the most fabulous woman That's in the great. world. She's worn the same shade of red lipstick and red nail polish since before I was born. Wow. Um, and I have this picture on my desk at work of her back in 1952, she was my age, of her in this full length skirt, this fabulous like ascot and like scarf around her neck and the sweater and she's shooting a baby browning. I think that picture is just so empowering. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely amazing and it shows that she, you can be both feminine and both fabulous and fierce with a firearm at the same time. Yeah. And, and also that we've had these rights since well before 1952. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had the right to, to own a firearm. It's a legacy since thing. Since before mm -hmm. we've had the right to own property before we had the right to vote, do, vote mm. to, to do anything. This is an, an original right, it's a natural right. And not to, not to continue with the Nana train, but I, I totally, I get it. Like my, my grandma was born mm. in China where same thing, like they don't have a lot of those same rights. Oh, and right. she was a, refu uh, a refugee in a refugee camp in Korea for a while. Wow. She had to cross wars, she had to play dead. She, she did so many amazing things that I think both myself and a lot of teenage kids these days would not be able to handle. And so, you know, then when she came here and she married my grandpa, he was off at war for, you know, years and in Vietnam and everything else. So she had six kids, does not, didn't have great English in, for a while. And so she's, you know, here, you know, making a living while he's gone, taking care of the kids, you know, doing everything. And she didn't quite have the confidence to open her own business. She wanted to open a restaurant and do certain things. And she's so proud of me now that I've been able to do that. And like my, my cousins, will show her my shooting videos on Facebook and she gets all excited yeah. to see my shooting videos. And she's just so, so proud that like, she laid that groundwork, right? Like she did what she needed to do to bring, you know, herself here, my mom, and then now me. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool to see somebody who didn't have those same opportunities and rights that I've been afforded to be so proud that that's now something I get to take advantage of.
such a great, great American story that I think it's, is mm -hmm. undervalued in today's era, yeah. which is right. why people like us so cling to that freedom that mm -hmm. your grandmother fought so hard yeah. to yes. get here. Your grandfather fought in Vietnam, my father fought in Vietnam, my grandfather, like the yeah. military lineage is long. And so, you know, for us taking that torch and saying, okay, what can I do for my country? Feeling that sense of patriotic duty, how am I gonna ensure that we keep maintain these freedoms is so, so critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing to be able to pass that on to my daughters, mm -hmm. to have them know that they can do anything and they can fight for what's truly important and stand for the flag and, and stand for their beliefs and stand for the Second Amendment and not be ashamed by it at all. Yeah, absolutely. It does make you think about your legacy too. Right? Mm -hmm. Like now it's on us to pass down this freedom, this what we have now to our daughters and our sons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And it, and it, you know, we're in this great American experiment, as they say, and no other place in the world has this, has what we have here right yeah. now. Yeah. And we're only making it better, especially by getting so many women in the shooting sports. <laughs> That's a wrap for this season of Love at First Shot, presented by Smith & Wesson and with ammunition provided by Federal Premium. We've been fortunate to have the opportunity to meet some fantastic women. Tess Saub, Lanny Barnes, Crystal Dunn, Tiffany Yerby Dillon, Cassie Bear, Melody Lauer, Lila Ontiveros, and Lydia Longoria. And of course, Julie Golub's precious daughter, Madeline. Each has carved out a niche for firearms in their lives, whether through competition, education, business, or advocacy. And all appreciate our Second Amendment freedoms that enable us to protect and defend ourselves and our loved ones. Thanks so much for tuning in to Love at First Shot. <laughs>